Good morning, folks. We're going to give it about another three to four minutes and then we'll get started.
All right, good morning, folks. I have 10 o'clock and I suggest we go ahead and get started on time. My name is Don Medellin. I'm a principal scientist at the South Florida Water Management District. And um, before we get started, uh, let me just say that, um, you know, I really appreciate your understanding for participating in this workshop as a webinar, as opposed to a face-to-face -face meeting, which is what we are all typically used to. Um, and before we get started on the format uh, associated with this workshop today, I'd like to turn it over to Lawrence Glenn, who is our Division Director for Water Resources, for some opening comments. So Lawrence, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Great, can everybody hear me? We can hear you fine. Excellent. Um, I would like to echo Don's comments. Thank you for your attendance today at this first public workshop for the water reservation. Uh, I wish I could look out into the crowd and see the faces because there's a very large number of you that have assembled today and we are happy that you are here and you brought your interest to this, this uh, water reservation rural development. Um, for many of you, um, You've been part of this process since it was initiated in 2008 before we had to put it on hold several times. So I'm sure your interest today will lie in, you know, what differences are in our draft rule language that have changed uh, and the changes associated to the comments that received at the end of the, of the last iteration. And then for some of you, it will be your first time uh, participating with this group and we welcome you and there's going to be a series of excellent presentations that'll go through what a water reservation is, uh, what the purpose is that we are doing this from the district standpoint now. Um, there'll be some, a lot of technical information that provides the basis for the needs for water to be reserved. And then that is the basis for the draft rule language that we will go over at the end of the process. So, uh, we again thank you for taking the time to attend here today. Uh, we've spent some time on the, the back end of this, preparing this forum and going through Zoom and we've tried to work out all the kinks. So hopefully we will be kink free, but if not, uh, please bear with us and I think we can resolve any issues we might have very quickly. Uh, we have a man behind the scenes that you may hear from time to time that will help us uh, move through this process. But again, I just thank you for your attendance today and what I think is gonna be a, a wonderful workshop on this rule development. I thank you and back to Don. Thanks, Lawrence. Uh, so let me give everybody a little bit of background about what the format's gonna to be today. Um, and just so you understand how to engage with our staff through this workshop, uh, there will be an opportunity for public engagement after each presentation today. We've got a total of about seven or eight presentations and at the conclusion of each presentation, we plan to address two to three questions pertinent to that presentation, and our staff will provide live answers for everybody at the workshop to hear. So if you look at the Q&A feature on your Zoom toolbar, there's a Q&A feature there. Opening this feature will allow you to ask one or more questions, and the Q&A feature also allows everyone else to see your questions and then live answers will be provided by our staff. And uh, so if you have a same, the same or similar question to one that's already been asked, the Q&A features actually allow you to upvote the same question by clicking on the thumbs up button. And then what happens is that Zoom will actually prioritize this question and shift it upward. And um, so specific questions, our staff intend to address will be repeated by the moderator at the end of each presentation and then answered live by our staff. You will not be able to ask the question live, but you can type in your question and type in as many questions as you want throughout the course of this workshop. And so what this allows us to do is allows greater interaction, allows everybody to see what questions are being asked, um, and then responses will be provided by district staff. They all, the other thing that's advantageous for us through this Q&A feature is that, that we're able to capture each of these questions. And then um, we can provide written responses to those questions that we didn't address during the workshop today. So there will be, uh, toward the end of this workshop, a public comment section. 
Uh, this will be a large block of time toward the end that we'll be able to address a lot of the remaining questions that were not addressed as we uh, went through each of the presentations. So with that, um, we're going to go ahead and get started and I'm going to turn the, um, you know, the next um, presentation here over and just kind of show you the workshop agenda. And like Lauren said, we're going to go over the water presentation, uh, the, excuse me, the water reservation process, give a recap of some of the past workshops. We're going to go into some of the detailed technical information regarding the uh, the purpose and underpinnings, technical underpinnings of why we need the water reservation and how it's uh, protective of fish and wildlife. Uh, there'll be an overview of the tech doc as well as um, covering the permitting criteria and then our new modeling tool. So that's, um, you know, and then again, the public comment and then we'll, we'll finalize the, the workshop today with next steps. What's the next steps and then uh, adjourn from there. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Tony Edwards and go ahead and start with the water reservation process. Thank you, Don, and good morning, everyone. We're going to start with a general overview of water reservations and then work our way into more specifics on the Kissimmee River and chain of lake reservations. The district gets its authority to develop and adopt water reservations in section 373.2234 of the Florida statutes. Reservations are adopted for either the protection of fish and wildlife or public health and safety. A reservation protects the use of the reserved water from consumptive uses. A reservation can be used to support a comprehensive Everglades restoration plan project, and they may be used as parts of recovery or prevention strategies for minimum flow and minimum water level water bodies. Next slide. Some things that water reservations do not do and are not intended to do include establishing an operating regime, drought proofing a system, ensuring wildlife proliferation. They do not prevent the use of unreserved water. Next slide. When we're developing a water reservation, we go through five main steps each one consisting of several smaller steps. The first thing we do is identify the reservation water bodies. Then we characterize the hydrology of those water bodies. And if the reservation is for the protection of fish and wildlife, we identify the fish and wildlife species to be protected. We then establish a linkage between the water body's hydrology and the water needs of those species. And then finally define and quantify specific amounts of water and types of water for the protection of those species. Next slide. We've adopted five reservations to date throughout the district. They're shown in the figure at the left. They're all for the protection of fish and wildlife. Their adoption dates are given after their names. The most recent of which was in 2014 for the Caloosahatchee River C43 West Basin Storage Reservoir. Collectively, all five of these reservations cover a little over 172,000 acres of the district. Next slide. The Kissimmee River and Chain of Lakes water reservations, when they are complete, will be adopted into Chapter 40E10 of the Florida Administrative Code. These water reservations are for the protection of fish and wildlife. And this is particularly important in this area because we have a number of unique resources. We have a very large concentration of nesting bald eagles, one of the largest in the country. We also have a nationally recognized largemouth bass fishery, which is not only important from a natural resource standpoint, but from a recreational standpoint. And there are a number of listed species, including the wood stork and the snail kite. Next slide. The Kissimmee water reservations include three groups of water bodies. The first is the upper chain of lakes, shown in pink on the figure to the left. This includes the lakes Hart and Mary Jane group, the lakes Myrtle, Preston, Joel group, the alligator chain of lakes, Lake Gentry, Lake Tohopeka Liga, East Tohopeka Liga, and the associated canals and smaller water bodies that connect these lakes. The second group 
is the headwaters revitalization lakes, shown in green on the figure. These include Lakes Kissimmee, Cypress, Hatchinaha, and Tiger, and the canals that interconnect them. The third group, shown in purple in the figure, is the Kissimmee River and floodplain. And this includes the Kissimmee River itself and the C-38 canal from the S-65 water control structure at the top of the purple area down to the S-65E structure at the southern end. It also includes the Istapoga Canal from the west side of the river west to the S-67 structure and a number of remnant river channels between S-65 and S-65E. The water bodies shown on the map in gray are contributing water bodies and we'll talk more about those in a moment. They contribute water to the reservation water bodies. Next slide. The Kissimmee Water Reservation area is 172,500 acres, which is a little more than the total amount of acreage of our other five adopted water reservations. So it's a very large area. It spans portions of the Upper Kissimmee Basin Planning Area, shown in the figure on the right within the green line, as well as portions of the Lower Kissimmee Basin Planning Area, shown within the orange line. The upper chain and the headwaters lakes are primary sources for the Kissimmee River further downstream. Therefore, these reservations will not only protect fish and wildlife in the reservation water bodies, they will support the $800 million Kissimmee River Restoration Project, which is ongoing to restore the historic flow of the Kissimmee River. Next slide. The water proposed for reservation includes both surface water and groundwater. In the upper chain of lakes, all surface water up to specific water reservation stages or water reservation lines is proposed for reservation. And we'll talk more about those lines in a moment. All surface water in the Kissimmee River and the headwaters revitalization lakes is proposed for reservation. Surficial aquifer system groundwater that is contributed to the reservation water bodies is proposed for reservation in quantities needed for the protection of fish and wildlife. In the contributing water bodies, those water bodies that I pointed out in gray on the previous map, groundwater and surface water is also proposed for reservation. This concludes my part of the presentation, so I'll now turn it over to Don for questions. Okay, uh, as I indicated to everybody at the beginning, there is a Q&A feature on your toolbar. And if you wanna go ahead and open that Q&A feature, you can type in any questions that you might have about the presentation. And so what we'll try and do is answer questions pertinent to each presentation. And um, if you see a question that's being asked uh, and you like it, or you have a similar question, you can always hit upvote a particular question with the thumbs up and that will prioritize the questions upward. So the first question we have is, who is responsible for the management of consumptive use permits? And this is from Diane Perry. Thank you for your question. And Diane, I'll go ahead and take this question. This is Don Medellin. Um, the district um, is responsible for the management of consumptive use. We have a consumptive use permitting program, and that program is um, basically a regulatory arm of the district where we uh, regulate all the consumptive uses, um, that is water withdrawals, either groundwater or surface water. All right, we have another question here from Brian Magic. Um, could the district please discuss how the reservation rule upon adoption will be applied to existing permits for water from the Kissimmee Basin system and to existing permits upon timely permit renewal? And Nick, would you care to answer this question? I realize that we're gonna have a regulatory um, presentation later, but Nick, do you wanna take this question? Sure. Um, the reservation rule will not apply to existing permitted legal users um, upon timely permit renewal. So they will not be considered uh, uh, 
using reserved water as long as they don't increase their allocation. So they're grandfathered in. Okay, we'll take one other question here. And this is from John Caprice. Have any other water reservations had similar wildlife purpose and how have they performed? Tony, I'll let you answer this question. Yes, all of our previous five water reservations were for the protection of fish and wildlife. And they span a number of years from 2009 to 2014. Uh, they're different. Some are, are reservoirs, some are estuaries and other wetlands. So they perform in a different manner. All right, we've gone through several questions. What I'd like to do is uh, continue through uh, our presentation. We'll come back to the Q&A portion again after each presentation and then also at the, during the public comment period at the end of the agenda. We'll have a large block of time to address many of the uh, unanswered questions. So with that, I'm gonna, we're gonna move on to the next presentation. And uh, this is Don Medellin. I'm just gonna give you a recap of our past uh, rural development efforts so that you have an idea of where we've come from in the past. This uh, project has a lot of history. And before I go there, I just wanna kind of explain a little bit about the, the river itself, is that one of the most important things is restoring the physical form of the river. And the way that we're doing that through the Kissimmee River Restoration Project is we're filling portions of the C-38 canal as well as removing water control stu structures and reconnecting river oxbows. And the important thing is the implementation of the reestablished hydrology. And that is actually occurring through the headwaters revitalization schedule. And the headwater lakes are, are basically being used to store significant amount of water to provide enough driving head out of this structure at S65 to push the water into the river and the river floodplain. And then finally, we have the water reservation lines uh, at the top of the watershed. And that's designed to protect the water that's needed for the restoration project and also for the fish and wildlife within each of these lakes as well as the downstream water bodies. So the water reservation was initiated initially in 2008-2009 timeframe. There was a technical document and draft rules developed at that time. Uh, it underwent the technical document and the modeling that was done at that time and the foundational concepts of the water reservation which were being carried forward with this water reservation received a very positive peer review, scientific peer review at that time. Um, it was delayed due to conflicts um, with the Kissimmee Basin Modeling and Operations Study, also known as KB Moss. Uh, there was a lot of um, conflicts with the same staff doing the same uh, work, and so uh, ultimately it was delayed. And then we reinitiated it in 2014, 2015. We held two public workshops during that time frame in 2014 on July 30th and December 12th, and we unveiled draft reservation rules at that December 12th meeting and then followed up with uh, a revised technical document in March of 2015. And uh, at that conclusion of the technical document, we received um, a lot of public comments and a lot of the public comments we have taken into account as part of this current rural development effort. But that effort in 2014, 2015 was delayed due to uh, concerns over listed species within Lake Okeechobee. So the current effort we're carrying forward with the foundational concepts and also trying to address uh, many of those uh, comments, public comments that we heard back in 2015, 2016. So what's changed since 2015? We have a new modeling tool. It's called the Upper Kissimmee Operation Simulation Model, also known as UK Ops. And this will be our regulatory tool as we go forward. And uh, we are using this to uh, measure 
uh, the threshold, which you will hear about through many of the presentations later, to um, make sure that we don't cross that critical threshold of the water needed for fish and wildlife. And we have the 5% at S65, which you'll hear about in later presentations. Also, um, we use this tool to evaluate different water withdrawal scenarios as a sensitivity testing, more or less. And so trying to understand how much water withdrawals in the upper watershed would it take to trip the 5% at S65. And as we go forward, this modeling tool will be used as our, uh, that our water use regulation staff will use as well as the regulated public to try and measure um, make, and to ensure that we don't exceed that threshold needed for fish and wildlife. We've also updated the technical document to include the best available data. The, the technical document draft that we had back in 2015, when we went back and looked at it, there was a lot of information that was outdated. So we've updated all of that technical information to make sure it's um, got the most current uh, technical information and data in it. Uh, finally, we've revised the, the rules uh, as um, uh, Tony kind of indicated. Usually we uh, have the water reservation rules as well as the applicant's handbook rules. The applicant's handbook rules, just so you understand, are the rules that are implement. That's our implementation criteria that we use for water use. And these rules have revised water reservation lines within the upper chain of lakes. They also uh, have all the updated permitting criteria since the last time uh, we met and unveiled the rules back in 20, 2014. And then uh, we've also included the regulation of contributing water bodies, which Tony alluded to in her presentation. And then finally, there's a downstream Lake Okeechobee constraint, which is being implemented as part of this rule to protect downstream users within the Lake Okeechobee service area. And with that, I'm going to take any questions that you might have um, regarding this portion of the presentation. So we'll take a few minutes for uh, questions and answers. So, so again, if you open the Q&A feature on your Zoom toolbar, you can ask questions and uh, the district staff will provide live answers. It gives us the ability to capture all the questions that you might have. So any ad additional questions you might have, we'll be glad to answer that. Don, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. There's a question from Galaxy S9 is the name that's listed, but that's the public's ability to ability to access and utilize traditional non-consumptive on these reservations have not been mentioned. Are the public's rights of continued and continuous access to traditional uses grandfathered? Okay, I'm, I'm having a, a little bit of a hard time hearing you, Camille. Could you repeat that question one more time? Sure, and it's under um, Brian Medjik's question. Um, it asks, are the public's rights of continued and continuous access to traditional uses grandfathered? Nick, would you like to answer that question? Yes, um, I'm, I was trying to see it in the text, but I can't see it. But I think the, uh, the question might be about um, traditional sources. So any use from upper Florida and aquifer is not considered reservation water bodies. So that's not included in the rule. And I don't know what the rest, could you repeat, if I didn't answer the entire question, is there additional portions? Hey guys, this is Zach. I think if, if you click expand all underneath Brian Medjik's question, you can see the actual typed one. I'm not sure why it registered there, but I am interpreting it as um, kind of a recreational question, are non-consumptive activities um, affected by these reservations. Okay, now I see it. 
Okay, yeah, I see it. It's non-consumptive activities. And I did answer the portion of the traditional uses that's exempt. It's not included in the rule. The traditional uses being um, the groundwater. So existing legal users are protected. They're, they're grandfathered in. Upper Florida and aquifer is a traditional source typically used in the area. And that is not considered reservation water body. So there's no issues with that. Okay. There's another question from Diane Perry. Uh, are minimum water levels set by fish and wildlife? Um, Diane, I think what we're going to do is we have several presentations that are going to talk about how the water reservations are actually established. So if you want to uh, hold on to that question for just a minute, we'll, I think we'll cover that in the uh, future presentations very thoroughly with the technical information our staff have. And there's another question here. Do you mean literally downstream on the river or downstream in the usage? It was that from an, an anonymous attendee. And I think if I understand the question correctly, when we're saying downstream on the river, the water reservations would cover not only the upper chain of lakes, it would co cover the headwater lakes as well as the river itself all the way down to S65E. So that's the, the scope of this water reservation, if that's what the question is. So with that, um, I think we're gonna go ahead to the next presentation and I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Steve Bosquin at this time. Steve, take it away. Thanks, Don. Um, Let's stay on this slide for a moment. I just wanted to say that as Tony mentioned earlier, um, the Kissimmee River Restoration Project is at the center of the water reservations. And, so that, and that's what uh, we mean in the title when we say the basis for the water reservations. Uh, you've already heard that no water will be allocated from the Kissimmee River or the Headwaters Lakes, which are the, the lakes that uh, feed the river. Um, and I'm going to give you a quick overview of the project itself, the Simi River Restoration Project, and the modeling used to determine whether there was water available for allocation from the project. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, Central and South Florida Flood Control Project, um, also known as CNSF, was a massive project through South Florida after um, hurricanes caused flooding in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, this image that you see on the, on the slide is um, a shot of a section of the C-38 in the lower basin. Um, you can see that it's a huge canal. Uh, the major, it's the major feature of CNSF in the lower Kissimmee Basin. The, um, it is uh, large enough to carry all flow that had formerly been carried by the river channel, uh, meaning these remnant channels that you see over on the right of the image. Um, I'm not sure if we have a cursor that can point to that, but um, that is called the remnant channel, uh, remnant in the sense that it, it is no longer functioning as a river channel. There is no flow in it because that uh, large, very large canal is conveying all flow between uh, Lake Kissimmee and Lake Okeechobee. Um, so this uh, construction of this canal had dramatic uh, consequences for the uh, Kissimmee River and the Headwaters Lakes. There was a complete loss of flow in the Kissimmee River channel, elimination of inundation of the Kissimmee River floodplain, and a reduction of stage variability in the Headwaters Lakes, which, as you'll hear later, had uh, profound consequences for the Headwaters Lakes. Um, and overall, just very dramatic effects on the ecology of the Kissimmee River and the Headwaters Lakes. Next slide, please. 
So uh, the goals of the Kissimmee River Restoration Project include reestablishing the river's historic hydrology. In other words, trying to get back to uh, the time prior to construction of C-30A. And that includes flow in the river channel, inundation of the Kissimmee River floodplain, which requires substantial amounts of flow from the Headwaters Lakes. Um, and these, uh, these changes in the river and the floodplain should help reestablish lost habitat. And that's expected to lead to recovery of fish and wildlife populations in the river, the floodplain and littoral zones on the, in the Headwaters Lakes. Ultimately, what we call recovery of the ecological integrity of the ecosystem. Um, and in the Headwaters Lakes, uh, the goal specifically is to improve the quantity and quality of littoral habitat due to higher lake stages. Next slide. So the, uh, the restoration project is restoring approximately one third of the Kissimmee River to its historic condition by backfilling a central section of the C-38 canal. You'll see a map of this in a moment. This will reestablish flow in the river channel and inundation of the floodplain. Uh, and it's important to remember that the key to any of this happening is, is not only construction, but it's also reestablishing historic hydrology. The historical timing and flow, volume of flow to the, um, from the Headwaters Lakes to the Kissimmee River. And the Headwaters revitalization schedule was developed to accomplish this. So this diagram on the right side is showing the two main components of the project um, in a very broad sense, reconnection and reconstruction of the actual physical form of the river by backfilling in the canal, for example, and re reconnecting river channels, and also modifying head in inflows from the Headwaters Lakes to mimic historical patterns of inflow to the Kissimmee River and ultimately restoration of ecological integrity. Next slide. So this map is showing uh, a few things that you've already seen. The upper chain of lakes uh, at the north end, in the middle, in the red oval, you're seeing the Headwaters Lakes. And uh, in the green oval at the bottom, you're seeing the uh, reservation water body for the Kissimmee River from S65 structure down to S65E. And uh, what you're seeing here on the right is an actual uh, zoom in on the specific uh, area of the Kissimmee River restoration project. And uh, so you can see what I mean by it's, it's uh, restoring a central section and, and it's approximately a third of the entire length of the C-38. Next slide. This, uh, this diagram, uh, yeah, you, 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 you just saw a regulation schedule appear and you may notice that this, this diagram, which is intended to show the ecological uh, meaning of these regulation schedules, um, this, th this diagram is showing the pattern of flow in the river or the uh, pattern of stage fluctuation in the Headwaters Lakes. And over uh, fall, winter into spring, uh, we're seeing a period of high water levels, uh, which inundate wetland plant communities. Obviously, as wetlands, they need water. Uh, it provides foraging habitat for fish and wading birds, and it provides spawning habitat for fish, nesting habitat for alligators, wading birds, fish, and, and waterfowl. And yeah, and this declining section of uh, this, this curve that you're seeing is a gradual recession, and we try to keep it gradual. Um, it provides uh, an endpoint for um, the high stages that we've seen, uh, meaning the wetland hydro periods. It reduces stranding of fish if it can be kept gradual and also keeping a gradual 
helps maintain water on the bird's nest, which is important to protect, protect nesting uh, birds from predation. And the low point of the schedule, uh, if it's done right, uh, can maintain flow during the seasonal low stage, flow to the river. And it also provides uh, stage variability for littoral habitat in the lakes. And then there's a rising limb of this diagram. Uh, and we try to keep that gradual also to avoid drowning apple snail eggs, uh, drowning app alligator nests, and other species. Next slide, please. Now this, uh, this diagram you're seeing here, I'm sorry, a little glitch here. This diagram you're seeing is the current regulation schedule called the interim regulation schedule. The blue line called the regulation line shows the stages at which we are required to begin flood control releases for flood protection. And once construction is complete, the plan is to raise the regulation line to this red line to provide the additional storage, water storage needed to restore the Kissimmee River and to benefit the Headwaters Lakes. Next. Uh, current status of the Kissimmee River Restoration Project. Uh, we've been through uh, decades of planning and construction and uh, planning back into the 1970s construction since about uh, the year 2000. Construction is expected to be finally complete in 2020. The project, as was mentioned earlier, is an $800 million projected investment. Uh, the full environmental benefits are expected following implementation of the headwaters schedule in 2020-2021. That uh, graphic on the left, uh, the image, is uh, showing what you've heard referred to as backfilling. Uh, what's happening is um, this fill material uh, is being pushed back into the canal. That material was originally dredged from construction of the canal, and uh, you're seeing heavy equipment pushing it back in and in one of these phases of construction. Next slide, please. So the basis of the water reservations, um, we looked at this with uh, a model called alternative formulation and evaluation tool, water reservation, abbreviated as AFETW. It was developed specifically for the Kissimmee Basin water reservations. The geographic scope is the entire Kissimmee Basin and the period of record for the hydrologic data was 1965 to 2005. And the width project base, which you'll see in a moment for this, I'm sorry, something just uh, popped up over my screen there. Um, the width project base is a, a time series of data that resulted from a simulation using AFETW uh, and this simulation included all components of the completed Kissimmee River Restoration Project in place, including use of the Headwaters Regulation Schedule. And next slide, please. So uh, this uh, graphic on the left is a diagram of an exceedance curve, which is based on the time series of hydrologic data that was uh, output from AFETW. Um, the axis on the, um, on the left, the y-axis, is showing inflows to the Kissimmee River Restoration Project. And the axis um, across the bottom, the x-axis, is showing uh, what we call exceedance. And it represents uh, the percentage of time that uh, a particular value on the y-axis is exceeded. So uh, towards the lower end of that x-axis, you're seeing um, very small proportions of time. As you get farther and farther up, you're seeing things that happen closer to a lot of the time. 
although you can see here that there's not much of that. So the green line shows the with project base that I mentioned a moment ago, which represents water in the system, water available in the system. The blue line is an upper target time series, and this was a time series developed to um, represent the water needed to meet the needs of the KRRP for fish and wildlife. And we made an effort to actually scale that back a little bit with the, something called the lower time series, which represented the water needed to meet a reduced set of performance measures. And the, the thing to notice here is that a target time series that is on or above the with project baseline indicates that the needs of KRRP fish and wildlife are not being met. Next. So uh, conclusions from this, um, don't, don't worry too much about um, not being able to see the details on the left graphic because the next slide will zoom in on that. Um, the main conclusion is that the upper and lower time upper and lower target time series lines are usually above the with project baseline, and that indicates that there is no water available for allocation. So ultimately the conclusion is no water is available to be allocated while protecting the public's investment to benefit fish and wildlife in the Kissimmee River and the Headwaters Lakes in the public interest. And just uh, the next slide is just a zoom in on that, the lower portion of that graphic uh, to show you that most of the time, uh, the upper um, target time series or the upper threshold on this graphic um, is above the um, with project base. So the modeling results, just to recap that, uh, the modeling results indicate that, that there is only enough water in the Kissimmee River and the Headwaters Lakes uh, to meet the needs of fish and wildlife. Um, and I did want to say that um, you will see additional um, presentations coming up um, that talk about um, water that uh, may be available for allocation. And that concludes my slides. All right, so this is Don Medallin again. So at this time, as I indicated at the beginning of the workshop, if you open the Q&A feature on your toolbar, uh, you can ask some questions to district staff and we intend to give you a live answer. So if you can uh, type some questions in and we will uh, that are we'll, we'll address some of the questions that are specific to this presentation right now. Don, this is Camille, and I see a series of questions from Diane Perry um, that Steve can address. Um, asking about flow to Lake O and if the river restoration is going to affect that and how many years this reconnection will take and when will it start and then what is used to manage water levels. Right, Steve, you want to start with the first question? And the question is, again, let me just repeat it. Would this reduce the flow to Lake Okeechobee, dot, 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 I hope? <laughs> <laughs> dot, 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 I hope. Uh, will the restoration reduce flow to, the, um, to, to Lake Okeechobee? Uh, actually not. Um, what, it, what it will do is change the timing of flow to Lake Okeechobee, um, you will see some um, information on Lake Okeechobee in, a, in, a, in a presentations that come after mine. Um, there are constraints um, on allocations based on how they affect Lake Okeechobee. The next question was, how many years will this reconnection take? When will it start? 
And uh, I think by start, she's referring to the headwaters uh, oh, schedule. Yeah. Well, the current, the current plan is to implement the headwaters schedule immediately following completion of construction. Um, we're expecting that, that that will be sometime in early 2021. Um, do you know there are a lot of um, there are a lot of variables, uh, so it may take a little longer or a little less time. And finally, uh, this is a different question um, from Arlene Stewart. So to be clear, there is no availability for a new consumptive use application, question mark. Nick, why don't you go ahead and answer that question? Yeah. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? I was busy answering a, a question. On no problem. Thing. Uh, so to be clear, there is no availability for a new consumptive use application, question mark. Um, there is water available for withdrawals, but it has to be the meeting the criteria that I will discuss later and it has to be above the reservation lines and there's a little bit of criteria there that I should go into more detail during my presentation. I think um, if, if the question was specifically about the Kissimmee River and Headwaters Lakes, I think the answer is uh, yes, that's, that's correct. There is um, no water that will be allocated. But as I mentioned in my talk, um, there is water that may be available for allocation in other parts of the system, specifically yes, the correct. upper, yeah, specifically the upper chain of lakes. Yeah, and contributing water bodies, so. Yeah, thanks, Nick. All right, there's an, another question here from John Caprice. Um, is there any report that documents the volumes of legal users that have been added and lost annually since 2008, since 2015? If not, can such data set be provided? Nick, why don't you go ahead and take that, answer that question. I'm sorry, I was typing another answer, so could you okay. just repeat one more time? Uh, is there any report that documents the volumes of legal users that have been added or lost annually since 2008, since 2015? If not, can such data set be provided? In the tech doc, we have a list of existing legal users within a half a mile buffer of all reservation water bodies, but we don't have, uh, we, we just have their permitted allocations. Um, if they want to know volumes of those, we don't have the volumes, but we do have, um, we had one permitted user uh, a couple years ago that actually is permitted under the criteria. So there is a volume that we have used UK ops that they have actually taken up a small portion. So if someone's asking if the, out of that 5%, of reduction of the historical annual flow going through S65, how much of that is remaining, then there's still most of that is remaining, but it's not quite 5% remaining because there's one user that did account for that under the rules. So I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Nick. And finally, uh, one of the question, uh, this is for Steve, uh, what is the target minimum lake level for Lake Kissimmee? Is it 52.5 above sea level, question mark? So Steve, I'll let you answer that. I'm sorry, I started to answer and I was on mute. Um, it's, it's asking for the target low stage in uh, Lake Kissimmee, is that correct? Yes, is it 52.5 feet above sea level? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, the, uh, I, I, I'm not sure I would call it a, a target, but the, uh, the lowest regulation schedule stage is 49 feet. 
Um, the lowest stage before we stop flow to the Kissimmee River is 48 and a half feet. And uh, even, even if we do that, um, conceivably it can be lower than that. Um, if, 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 if uh, for example, if rapid transpiration continues to lower stage in the lake. Um, I'm, I'm wondering though, if the question meant to ask about the target high stage. Well, but, uh, the question says that what is the target stage. minimum lake stage, lake level for Lake Kissimmee? Is it 52.5? Yeah. Well then, yeah, so my answer applies. I, I guess the person who asked the question could clarify later on if necessary. Okay. All right. And this is Lawrence. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I, I think there may be a, a misunderstanding uh, between a reservation and a minimum flow and level and that the, it's a different construct and where Lake Okeechobee has a, a minimum stage that this question is posing, uh, the water reservation doesn't work off of a minimum level like a minimum uh, stage. So there, there are two different mechanisms that have two different bases for how we, we form and style and look at what volumes are necessary, if that helps clarify the answer. Thanks. Yeah, and, and my, my answer was specifically about the, um, the regulation schedule that regulates Lake Kissimmee. So it, it doesn't apply to minimum flows and levels. All right. Thank you, Steve. I think with that, we'll go ahead uh, to our next presenter. And, um, and it'll be uh, Sean Scully. Sean, take it over, please. Thank you, Don. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to give a fairly brief overview of the contents of the document that memorializes the process, the rationale, and the, the technical, both environmental, hydrologic, and the modeling approaches used to develop and explain the rationale for the water reservation. Next slide. The purpose of this technical document is to memorialize and explain the scientific and technical data, approaches, modeling tools, and assumptions that all lead to determining the proposed water reservations for the protection of fish and wildlife in the water bodies uh, and surrounding and surrounding water entities for the Kissimmee River and Chain of Lakes. Next slide. The technical document, which is slightly over 300 pages, including six appendices, uh, begins with uh, two, uh, two or three fairly brief chapters, an introduction, a, a basis for the water reservations, a description of water bodies, the ecological explanation, uh, both uh, for, for fish and wildlife and the associated hydrologic requirements. And then chapter five, which is fairly detailed, uh, includes a description of the methods, uh, tools and analysis used to identify the reserved water. Next slide. Chapter one gives you the overview and purpose for the water reservations. It explains uh, in text and visually the reservation water bodies. Uh, it gives a history and background of the development and prior efforts, as Don had explained earlier today, including the, the prior work. And this uh, introduction is about seven pages in length. Next slide. The basis for water reservations, chapter two is again a, a brief chapter, about three pages, gives you the authority, the uh, the actual uh, citing in Florida statutes that gives the water management district the authority and then explains the, the rulemaking process which will conclude with codifying the water reservation in the Florida Administrative Code. Next slide. Chapter three is uh, another factual description of the reservation water bodies for all the, for all the areas um, under this proposed water reservation. It gives an overview of the Kissimmee Basin, both the water bodies, contributing areas, the canals that connect the water bodies, and a description of the water 
control structures that the Water Management District operates as part of the CNSF project to regulate water levels. It also, in, and that would be under the water connectivity subsection. The groundwater is also uh, described and a full description of the contributing water bodies as was presented earlier is included in this chapter. Next. Chapter four is a fairly extensive detailed chapter. It has all the information and data used to identify the fish and wildlife resources and the associated habitat, specifically the lake littoral vegetation, which means the vegetation that, that typically lies around the perimeter of these lakes, which serves as uh, multi-purpose for uh, fish and uh, birds and uh, reptiles as well. And it gives a, a, an associated overview of the hydrology of the region in terms of rainfall and how water levels are managed and how decisions about uh, whether to open water control structures uh, are made. And that's uh, with the regulation schedules and you see a typical regulation schedule at the bottom of the slide there. And most importantly, it then this chapter then summarizes and begins to link the biological information with the associated hydrology. And uh, based on the, the scientific research and based on what the needs of the fish and wildlife are in terms of hydrology. Next slide. Chapter five is also quite extensive, more than 30 pages. It gives the rationale for reserving all the surface water in the Kissimmee River and headwaters revitalization lakes. And it established, gives, also gives the rationale for establishing water reservation lines in the upper chain. So what you see here uh, to the right are examples of water reservation lines. And it gives, uh, they are overlaid with the regulation schedules. And the concept here is the water reservation lines, which you see in the black, sometimes are lower than the regulation schedule line. And that gives uh, a visual uh, representation of the opportunity for consumptive use allocation for some of the water bodies. And then this chapter also includes an evaluation of impacts to existing legal users. Next slide. The chapter also talks about two additional criteria, uh, which we've heard briefly uh, in this presentation and we'll hear more uh, in, in a subsequent presentation about the S65 downstream threshold, as well as what's called the Lake Okeechobee constraint for the Lake Okeechobee service area. These are checks for that will be evaluated uh, when incoming consumptive use permit applications are received. And the, this chapter also includes a detailed description of the Upper Kissimmee Operation Simulation Model, which will be the agency's tool to evaluate proposed future water use withdrawals. Next slide. And the technical document concludes with six appendices, uh, which is, was roughly two thirds of the content. Uh, they include water reservation, water bodies, and contributing area detail descriptions, the actual water proposed for reservation, supporting information, documentation, and scientific peer review reports on the UK Ops model, as well as their uh, work product that was delivered in 2009. And the last appendix includes additional information about the fish and wildlife and habitat communities in the Kissimmee River and floodplain. And with that, concludes my presentation. Thank you, Sean. Appreciate the, uh, the overview of the technical document at this time. Um, as I indicated previously, if you have any questions, if you'll open the Q&A feature on the Zoom toolbar, you can type in your questions about the technical document. And we, uh, our staff worked very hard, I will tell you, to not only get the technical document done roughly two weeks before the workshop, but also the draft rules. So um, a lot of work went into that. 
And if you have some questions, we'll go ahead and take the questions and you can type them in as many questions as you want at this time. So Don, we have two questions from Diane Carey. The first one is how often do you report and who set goals? And Diane, I'm not sure that I understand the question when you say, do you report and who sets the goals? Um, the water reservation is a, once it's adopted, it's basically a rule that is implemented through a water use regulation program. And so as applications come in, those applications would be evaluated with uh, the criteria to make sure they fall in line with the criteria and meet the per permitting criteria. And so that is um, how the water reservation works. It looks um, like Jennifer Brown would like to answer that live. Yes, to go ahead, answer. Jennifer. Good morning, Diane. Um, if you're talking in terms of the goals for the restoration project, that is determined as part of a public process um, between the parties who are um, doing the restoration project. So the restoration goal for the Kissimmee was developed um, jointly in the public process with the federal government, the Army Corps of Engineers, the district, um, the service, and a bunch of cooperating agencies. Um, and I believe that report, um, that uh, restoration project had set some reporting requirements, but also on a monthly basis, um, Mr. Lawrence Glenn, who is part of the meeting, um, does report on the status of water levels and um, wading birds, alligators, snail kites um, to the governing board in his monthly ecological conditions report. And uh, I would add that uh, for the restoration project, uh, we, for, for new data that's coming in, we report annually in the South Florida Environmental Report, which is published by the district annually. Um, in, the, in the future, as we go into post-construction evaluation, um, there will be uh, annual, annual updates on virtually all of our um, evaluation studies. Great. Thank you all for those answers. Camille, do we have any more questions? It all looks right. like Diane Perry has a follow-up. Um, if there's time, permitting criteria, withdrawal use, the point of withdrawal, how many miles around the point of water removal is considered for effect on environment? I think I answered that in writing, and so it's going to be covered in the next uh, presentation, but if it's from a groundwater withdrawal from surficial aquifer, the threshold we're looking at for indirect withdrawals of groundwater is a drawdown of 0.1 foot at the edge of the reservation water body. So that is the threshold for determining if withdrawals from a well are using reservation water body and subject to the rule. Okay, with that, uh, why don't we go ahead and um, move on to our next presentation and any of those questions that you might have burning questions again you can ask them in the Q&A section of the uh, toolbar in Zoom and then we'll we'll have a large block of time at the end of all the presentations to answer any uh, additional questions that we didn't get to in between. So with that I'm going to turn it over to Zach Welch. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Zach Welch. I'm a lead scientist working in the lakes and rivers ecosystem section at the district. I'll be talking to you about the basis for the water reservation lines and how they were established for the water bodies in the upper chain. Next slide. So I wanted to start by talking about some basic concepts uh, regarding hydrology and how it affects fish and wildlife habitat in these lake systems. So in each of the water bodies, habitats are distributed along elevation gradients. There's the obvious lake upland interface where the terrestrial systems transition into wetlands. There's a marsh or the littoral zone where a suite of wetland and aquatic species occur. And there's an open water portion of the lake, the limnetic portion, 
and that's where water is too deep or light penetration is not sufficient to support any plant growth. Now, the littoral zone is a critical component of these systems for fish and wildlife. They support the life cycles of most of the species within the system. They're by far the most productive portions of the lakes. Really, without the littoral zones, you essentially have a reservoir with little aquatic life. Now, the upper boundary of the lake, or the size of the lake, that's established by the annual high water, if you'll click, um, or the maximum lake stage from year to year. The size of the marsh is, or how far down slope plants occur in the lake, that's affected by the annual low water or the minimum lake stage. So hydrology affects the type of habitat in the lake, how much of it there is, how available it is to fish and wildlife. Some species use the littoral zone when it's wet and others use it when it's dry. So you'll go to the next slide. Now within the marsh system, the littoral zone, there's a suite of plant communities and they occupy different niches based on their tolerances to flooding. Where they occur on the slope depends on the hydrology and how much flooding they can tolerate. Obviously if you lower the maximum lake stages, everything would move down slope and the lake would just get smaller. And this has happened to most lakes in Florida, of course, at least 50 years ago as we developed watersheds and, and moved into the wetlands around these systems. Next slide. But you can have dramatic effects on the littoral zones without changing the maximum lake stages. If you keep the annual high water the same but lower the minimum, the size of the lake, you know, where that upper boundary occurs, stays the same. But the plant communities march down slope. You shrink the open water portion of the lake or the unvegetated portion, and you increase the size of the littoral zone. Next slide. Now, similarly, of course, if you keep the maximum lake stages but you raise the minimum, the plant communities march upslope, which increases the open water portion or the unvegetated, port unvegetated portion of the lake, and it reduces the size of the littoral zone. Next slide. So while the max and min lake stages are important, the timing associated with how a lake transitions from high to low and back again is also very important. So the graph in the upper right shows the duration and how it can then vary the duration of flooding uh, within a marsh based on how much time a lake spends at the maximum versus the minimum lake stage. So the red line, for example, would represent a system that stays near the minimum most of the year, only reaches the maximum stage for a brief period of time before going back to the minimum. And a marsh in that system would consist of short hydroperiod communities that move far down slope with an abrupt transition to mostly aquatic species when you get around the minimum stage. Now the opposite end of the spectrum is the light blue. Um, that's where lake stages would stay near the high water line most of the year, uh, spend very little time at the minimum lake stage. And there would be a marsh associated with that system of long hydroperiod communities. There wouldn't be very much short hydroperiod communities at all. And the habitat would be mostly available to those critters that use it when it's flooded. So these three factors that I talked about, the maximum, the minimum, and the transition between those, those are the critical hydrologic components affecting the habitat type, the distribution, and it's available to fish and wildlife on the lake. If you'll click forward, done. And two more. Now in the Kissimmee chain, these factors are established by the regulation schedules, as we heard Steve talk about as well. And these have been in place for about 50 years or so. And the water reservation lines we're talking about are established to protect these long-term hydrologic patterns that support the fish and wildlife that have evolved under these conditions. Next slide. It's also important to note that in the Kissimmee chain, uh, these water bodies, they tend to be very shallow, so the light reaches the bottom in large portions of the lake. They're subtropical, so there's a long growing season, and they're nutrient rich, so they support robust plant growth. So the littoral marsh can occupy large portions of the lakes. They're extremely productive habitats for the fish and wildlife. They support, as we heard from Tony, world-renowned fisheries and wildlife populations. We have tourists come from Asia and Europe just to see the birds and fish the lakes. And they're also the first filter for the water before it heads south. These systems, keep in mind, do a great job of taking up nutrients and cleaning the, wa the water in these lake systems. Next slide. Uh, I think it's important to recognize the pre-regulated patterns in these lakes to understand how much they've changed since regulation. So this is actually uh, an example from Lake Toho, if you'll click forward a couple down. The gray portion of the graph here shows wet years in the 40s and 50s, which range roughly from the average to very wet, but not the maximum. So the 50th to 90th percentiles of years. 
And in red, you can see the current regulation schedule. And then in blue, you can see the same kind of wet portion of years, but for the regulated period record. And you can see the reduced variability in the system, the lower stages and wet years overall. You can also see the reduction in stages in the late spring, where around the March time frame, the schedule um, pulls stages down. And that's to create storage in the system for flood control before the rainy season begins. If you'll click through a couple, Don. Now, this is important, as I said, for flood control storage, but it does reduce stages in the lake at a time that's really the peak breeding season for many fish and wildlife species. So this March 15th point, where a lot of the schedules in this, in this region uh, pull water down for flood control, it's the focus point for us in protecting the transitions from the annual highs to the annual lows in these regulated systems. Next slide. So this regulation line is shown in yellow, and this is for Hart Mary Jane. To account for the three critical hydrologic factors we talked about, the maximum, the minimum, and the transition between those, how much time stages spend near the min or max, we used historical lake stages from 1972 to 2009, or roughly the last 50 years of hydrology. And to account for the duration at high stage, we used the average date stages reached the top of the schedule, as well as the average duration that stages stayed at the top of the schedule. And that gives us our protection of duration at high stage, uh, we also want to protect average breeding season water levels. We use the average of stages on March 15th. And similarly, to protect the annual minimum, we use the bottom of the regulation schedule. And to protect the ability of lakes to refill, um, we protect it up to the regulation schedules in the wet season, other than uh, rapid rises in water level that may occur in the early June time frame. Next. So if you'll click two more, Don. You can see this establishes the water reservation line in black. And the water below that line, as we heard, would not be available for consumptive use. It's protected for fish and wildlife. And the water above that would be available for withdrawals. Next slide. So as we go through these water reservation lines for the water bodies, you'll notice the regulation schedules in yellow, the water reservation lines in black. The shaded blue areas represent the inner quartile of lake stages over the past 50 years or so. And you can think of these as the moderate years, if you'll go back one, Don. The 25th to 75th percentile represent kind of the moderate conditions. They exclude the driest 25% and the wettest 25%. And you'll note that the shaded portion varies relative to the regulation schedule. That means some water bodies tend to have stages near the top of the schedule when others don't. And so by basing our water reservation line on these historical stages, we account for the varying hydrologies between the systems and the fish and wildlife that are supported by those. So as I mentioned, this is Hart Mary Jane. We'll click to the next one is the alligator chain. This line, you can see the interquartile ranges is lower relative to the regulation schedule, and so is the water reservation line. Next slide. This is for Lake Gentry. Again, note how the stages tend to be less variable in this lake and tend to be closer to the regulation schedule than the prior group. Next slide. This is the regulation schedule for Mer Myrtle Joel Preston, which looks a little different. Uh, the regulation schedule tends to draw stages down beginning in December instead of March, so the water reservation line is essentially the same as the regulation schedule when you protect the duration at high and the average mid-March stage. And the next schedule, or the next slide, please, which is the next schedule, conveniently enough. This is for East Lake Toho. Uh, these last two water bodies, East Lake Toho and Lake Toho, we had an additional consideration in establishing the lines due to recent management of lake stages over the past five to 10 years. In these systems, the lake stages have a greater magnitude of variation between the max and the min. You'll notice this is a three foot variation, whereas in a lot of the other lakes, we only have about two, one and a half feet variation. So if conditions are wet, and the lake stages are following along the top of the regulation schedule. From March through May, you can see the change in water levels right during the peak of the growing season would be rather quick, arguably much faster than would occur in a natural system. So for these reasons, lake managers have tended to implement recession rates that are more similar to those along the dashed lines. The dashed line there represents stages from 2012 to 2019, excluding 2016 because we had emergency high water operations that year, so it was a different, different ball game. And it promotes a more natural recession of water levels and reduces the chance that breeding is interrupted from rapidly declining lake stages. So the dashed line 
um, shows this average over the last few years. And in the case of East Toho and Lake Toho, uh, the portion of the water reservation line at the max of the schedule was also shortened a little to reflect this recent management. And the March 15th stage was lowered for the same reason. So the water reservation line essentially is similar to the recent management in these two systems. So if you'll click to Lake Toho, you'll see the same example. And with that, that's my presentation, and I'll be happy to take questions. All right. Thank you, Zach. Again, if uh, you folks have any questions related to this presentation, which provides a lot of the foundation and basis for the water reservation in the upper chain of lakes, uh, please feel free to ask those questions. Camille, you want to see if there's any? Sure. And I also have a question from Marty Mann, who was, uh, this question was to us outside this presentation, um, but he's a fisheries biologist with the, with the Florida Fish and Wild Conservation Commission, and he works in the Kissimmee Chain of Lakes. And we thought this was an important question to um, include here that would be of interest to other people. So um, the large, as Zach, Zach just described, large, Large lake fluctuations have occurred on the Kissimmee chain of lakes in the historical past, but due to development and agricultural practices within the floodplain of the Cape Coal, lake level has stabilized for over 50 years. Although this effort has been successful for flood, flood control purposes, it has been detrimental to littoral zone habitat. Unfortunately, extreme highs are no longer feasible, but extreme lows have been achieved through managed drawdown. These extreme low events have served as mitigation to restore lake habitat. So that's similar to the uh, project that's going on on East Lake Toho, or it is the one example is the project that's going on East Lake Toho now. His question is, in the future, how does the district plan on integrating extreme lake drawdowns within the water reservation rules on any and all lake within the Kissimmee chain of lakes? The answer is the proposed reservation rules will not affect the management of the lakes themselves and will not prevent lake drawdowns. These restoration activities will continue the same as in the past with an interagency approval process. The applicant's handbook, which will be described later, is a provision which allows the surface water to be withdrawn when water is being released for environmental purposes with prior approval by the district. And right. I think we have a couple of other questions, if we have time. Yes. Okay, so from Jerry Smith, how does water quality influence the decision-making process of regulation schedules? I was going to see if Cal wanted to answer this. It has to do with the creation of regulation schedules, which is an Army Corps thing, but I thought Cal might have the best answer for that, and whether water quality is taken into account in establishing those. Yeah, this is Cal. Can you guys hear me all right? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, sorry. I was having a problem finding my mute button. Um, the question does not, at first glance, appear relevant to the water reservation issue. Um, it's a generic question, as I read it, um, asking how regulation schedules consider water quality. Um, just to clarify, this workshop and the water reservation for the Kissimmee it's not about changing any regulation schedule. It's about establishing criteria for protecting the environment. But to answer the question, with all that said, um, regulation schedules um, are typically developed by the Army Corps of Engineers for the Central and Southern Florida Project uh, water bodies, namely the, the lake systems, the water conservation areas, and water quality is always a consideration of the Army Corps. I don't think they formulate for water quality, but uh, water quality is a factor that they consider. And that's certainly true of the existing Lake Okeechobee regulation schedule study, also called LOSOM, that's ongoing now. All right. Thank you, Cal. Appreciate it. Uh, there's another question here. 
How are hurricanes taken into consideration in the watershed hydrology flow and water balance? And that's from Khalil As 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 Tassi. Uh, Zach, do you want to try and answer that? Sure, John. So as you noted, we use the historical hydrologies in the system. So that includes um, years that would have had uh, droughts or, or hurricanes or those things. So that's one of the benefits of using uh, observed historical stages is your, you know, those are the kind of events that, that helped establish the habitat for fish and wildlife in these systems. And so we want to take those into account when we establish these water reservation lines. Okay, thanks, Zach. There's another question here from Robert Beltran. Was this water reservation considered in the recent findings of the 2020 CFWI Regional Water Supply Plan? Specifically, the plan identified a safe yield, a safe yield for the aquifer in the Central Florida area. And Robert, um, Nick, do you want to answer this question? Yeah. Um, so the CFWI is concerned with the upper Florida aquifer. And so the upper Florida aquifer is not a reservation water body. You know, it does not include reservation withdrawals. So it doesn't apply to the Kissimmee Reservation. OK. So it, so it doesn't apply to the upper Florida aquifer. All right, thank you, Nick. All right, with that, I think we'll move on to the next presenter. And David Anderson, I'm gonna let you take it away, David. Okay, thanks, Don. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Um, much of the water that flows through the Kissimmee River actually originates in the upper chain of lakes uh, portion of the basin. And if you add up the flows at, uh, at S61 coming from the Toho side of the chain and at S63A uh, coming from the alligator chain and Lake Gentry part of the chain, those combined volumes account for about 53% of the discharge at S65 on an average annual basis. Um, Allocations that are made from the upper chain of lakes, therefore, could reduce the S65 discharge to the Kissimmee River. And therefore, a check on allocations from the upper chain of lakes is needed to protect fish and wildlife in the headwaters revitalization lakes and the Kissimmee River and floodplain. Next slide. Um, to develop this downstream check, we went back to the upper target time series and the lower target time series that um, Steve talked about earlier from the AFETW modeling. Um, the, uh, together, the upper and the lower target time series represent a range of flows at S65 that, protect the, that, that are protective of fish and wildlife in the Kissimmee River and floodplain. And these time series are just shown in the graph at the right as uh, flow exceedance curves. Um, and Steve explained the uh, discharge shown on the, um, on the vertical axis, the Y axis, and the horizontal axis is the exceedance or the percent of time exceeded over the period of record. If we go to the next slide. The, um, the upper and lower target time series um, indicate how much the S65 discharge can be reduced and still be protective of fish and wildlife in the Kissimmee River. Allowing a reduction from the upper target time series to the midpoint between the upper and the lower provides an additional margin of safety for the protection of fish and wildlife in the Kissimmee River. Average annual discharge for the upper target time series is 1,077 cubic feet per second. Uh, for the lower target time series, it's 976 cubic feet per second. And the midpoint is 1,026.5 cubic feet per second. The reduction of the average annual discharge from the upper target time series to the midpoint is 5%. 
and um, limiting allocations from the upper chain of lakes so that collectively they do not reduce the average annual discharge at S65 by more than 5% should protect fish and wildlife of the, um, in the Kissimmee River and floodplain. Um, Nick is going to talk more about this in the next presentation um, about how this uh, downstream check and the 5% will be implemented in the, in the permitting process. Uh, so I'll, I'll end there uh, if there are any questions. Thank you, David. So again, if you'll go to the Q&A feature on your Zoom toolbar, you can type in any questions you might have for David, but he covered the basis of the 5%, uh, making sure that the flows um, aren't reduced more than 5% at the S65 structure, which is the south end of Lake Kissimmee. So right now, I don't see any more questions being typed in. I'll give it another few minutes, another minute, a minute at the most. And then um, if we don't have any questions about this particular presentation, we'll go on to the next presenter. Um, and I just wanted to mention to everybody that um, you can ask as many questions as you want on this Q&A question portion of the, the Zoom feature that's provided there. And then we'll either provide a live answer from our staff or we'll, uh, for those questions that aren't addressed live, we will provide written comments at the conclusion of the workshop and we'll post it out there on the webpage. All right, uh, I think we'll go on to the next presenter. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Nick Patani. Nick, go ahead and take it away. All right, thank you, Don, and good morning, everyone. So I'm going to be discussing how the proposed reservation rule will apply to consumptive use permitting at the South Florida Water Management District. And I'd like to mention right out uh, at the front of this that the reservation rule does not prevent the, any new uses or new water use applications from having to meet the criteria that we currently have in uh, 40E2 and chapter 373.223 for conditions for issuance of water use permits. So above all, that's the first criteria that we will always look at for all uh, permitting. Uh, so just wanted to mention that. So in addition to that, then we're, we'll now talk about how the reservation rules apply to consumptive use. And you've seen this diagram before. This is just the area of the Kissimmee Basin. You have your upper chain of lakes, then your headwaters revitalization lakes, and then your Kissimmee River and floodplain. So go ahead and the next one. So the regulatory criteria that's being changed or added. Uh, so 40E10, Florida Administrative Code is water reservations. And so we're adding some definitions and also in 0.031, how the rule is gonna be implemented. And then the consumptive use permitting in 40E2, Florida Administrative Code, we're gonna have the Kissimmee rule in there adopted or incorporated by reference. Some of the new things being added in our regulatory criteria is 40E10.071, which is the Kissimmee reservation. And then in the applicant's handbook, subsection 3.11.5, that's gonna be a new subsection that specifically discusses the criteria for the Kissimmee Reservation. Okay, so on some of the definitions, and we'll be using these uh, throughout, particularly two types of withdrawals. There's gonna be surface water withdrawals and groundwater withdrawals. Surface water withdrawals are pretty straightforward. You have a pump on a surface water body. Groundwater withdrawals from reservation water bodies, we, we call indirect withdrawals of groundwater because you're pumping from a well and indirectly it could induce seepage from the surface water body. And so this diagram on the right on the top shows you have a drawdown from a well, a pumping well, and our criteria we're using to determine if indirect withdrawals would be occurring from a surface water reservation water body is a 0.1 foot of drawdown. So where the arrow is shown in this particular example, if the well pumping creates a 0.1 feet of drawdown at the edge of the water body, then it's considered an indirect withdrawal. 
And then the diagrams below just show when the well is shut off, the water table returns back to static. And this 0.1 foot of drawdown is consistent with other restricted allocation areas in the district. Next slide. All right, so these are some exclusions from the reservation rule. So I think we mentioned a little bit earlier, existing legal users are not subject to the rule. And particularly any renewals that come in with no increased allocation. So those are basically grandfathered in. Renewals or transfers with no changes, those are grandfathered in. And as I mentioned earlier, withdrawals from the Florida aquifer system are not considered um, using reserved water. Um, there's a couple of other instances where we do not consider these to be using reserved water. And the first is we have uh, dispersed water management pro projects and withdrawals uh, would be allowed upon district authorization for that. And if we have any discharges from reservation water bodies from uh, CNSF project for flood protection, environmental releases or operation and maintenance, then those also would be not considered to withdraw reserved water. Next slide. All right, so what is being reserved? We've seen these graphs before uh, in the presentations, and this is East Lake Tahopecalaga. That's actually the correct pronunciation. Um, so this is an example uh, for my you know, discussion here. Um, we're gonna break down the reserved areas in three different areas. It's the upper chain of lakes, and then the Headwaters Revitalization Lakes and then Cassini River and Floodplain. The upper chain of lakes is the most unique of the, of the three areas. So we'll go here first. So upper chain of lakes, each of the reservation water bodies has a regulation schedule and the re water reservation line, which is shown here in the black. So surface water is reserved up to the reservation line shown. So any surface water withdrawals at or below that reservation line would not be allowed. It's reserved. Indirect withdrawals of groundwater is also reserved when the 0.1 feet of drawdown intersects the water body. And there's a downstream check we will talk about later as, as some examples of how we do this. But if we're looking at the stage at the official monitoring location at the reservation water body, that is uh, basically when that stage is above the reservation line, then withdrawals would be allowed, but anything below that reservation line, at or below the reservation line, is reserved. And any surface water in contributing water bodies basically has the same restriction, but we would look at the downstream check. So if we have a surface water body, the monitoring uh, stage we would look at is the immediate downstream reservation water body from that contributing water body, and anything is reserved if anything that's at or below the reservation line. And I'll go through some examples in a few minutes. Okay, so the next area, Headwaters Revitalization Lakes and Kissimmee River and Floodplain. I'm lumping these two together because it's basically the same type of reservations. All surface water in the lakes and the, and the Headwater Revitalization Lakes, that's Kissimmee, Cypress, Hatchnahaw, Tiger, uh, then Lake Kissimmee, uh, Kissimmee River and floodplain, so all surface water re is reserved. Contributing water bodies to these reservation water bodies is reserved up to the reservation line as shown. Next slide. All right, so that was what was reserved. What is available for allocation? Well, everything above the reservation line, basically. Um, so the first thing is, as I will discuss in, in the example a little bit later, there's gonna be daily allocations available. So it's gonna be checking the actual stage with the reservation water line on that particular day. And there's gonna be basically daily allocations given. So in the upper chain of lakes, and this is another uh, Lake Toho chart, surface water withdrawals from the reservation water body or contributing water body is allowed as long as the lake stage exceeds or is above the water reservation line for that day. It's gonna be a daily check. Indirect withdrawals of groundwater is the same thing. Um, when the contributing water body is above or from the reservation water body is above the re reservation line, 
then it's available for allocation. And this is done on a daily basis. So it's gonna be um, less than a one in 10 year certainty, which I'll talk about. Go ahead in the next slide. So that was the upper chain of lakes for the headwaters revitalization lakes and Cassini River and floodplain. The only things available for allocation are direct surface water and indirect withdrawals from contributing water bodies. So only from contributing water bodies and only when the water level at S65 is above the water reservation line shown in the graph. And again, it's a daily check. Go ahead. Okay, so in addition to the, the criteria that I just mentioned, there's a couple of things here to, to consider is upon deciding if a new permittee would like to come in and use a surficial aquifer or reservation water body as a potential source, they need to consider that the source is not going to have a typical one in 10 level, uh, one in 10 year drought level of certainty as we normally do in non-restricted allocation area. So there's going to be limited availability of the allocations. And as I mentioned, it's going to be a daily allocation check. So we're going to have to allocate water on a daily basis, checking with the actual levels of the lake stages with the reservation water body. And I'll go through some examples of that in a few minutes. And in addition to the daily checks, there, the volumes have to be reported uh, on a weekly basis. So daily checks have to be made and I'll show you the form in a few minutes that we have to use for compliance of this. Next slide. Okay, so upon applying for permitting for new users for increased or the first check is, as was just mentioned before, the flow through the historical flow through S65 as shown on the on the right there shall not be reduced by 5% of the historic average annual flow over the 49 year simulation period. So that is actually the first check, but it's done at the time of permitting. And we are going to be keeping track cumulatively of all users that are being permitted under this criteria. And upon usage of the 5%, of the flow going through or the redu reduction of the historical flow going through S65 and then after 5% has been taken up then there's no more permitting for the reservation water bodies. Currently there is one permitted user that was actually permitted a couple of years ago actually under the current criteria and they've accounted for already some of that 5% of the flow so really right now 4.18% of the historic flow uh, is remaining and it's a pretty large amount. It's in acre feet per year and Cal will go over a little bit of that um, in his presentation. So once the existing permitted users have their permit and they're doing their checks, so there's a couple of downstream checks. One is when you have a contributing water body as a potential source, then the downstream checks would be one, the immediate uh, downstream reservation water body and then the second downstream check would be withdrawals would only be allowed if discharges are being made from Lake Okeechobee to either the Caloosahatchee River or St. Lucie estuary. So this provides even less of a one in 10 year level of certainty. So not only do you have to meet the reservation lines, you have to also do the downstream check or the Lake Okeechobee constraint and this was designed uh, to protect existing legal users from further uh, shortages of their water um, in the Lake Okeechobee service area. So I'm gonna go through some examples. Okay, next. Okay, I have two examples for you. Uh, so this is already existing legal user that says, all right, we have our permit, so we wanna decide uh, every day what water is available. So again, we're gonna use my favorite lake, Lake Tohoku Caliga. Here's the, the hydrograph on the left and the table on the right that is used to construct that graph. And you notice that every day there is a, a, an actual elevation. So you can actually look up every day of the year and see what the exact reservation stage is for that lake on that day. So you basically compare the actual lake stage from the official district monitoring location to the reservation stage. And it's sort of a red light, green light thing that if the lake stage is above 
the water reservation stage, then withdrawals could occur upon meeting the downstream check of the Lake Okeechobee constraint. All right, so this is the example we're gonna use, Lake Okeechobee. Go ahead and the next one. All right, so on this example, on the left shows the approximate location of a surface water withdrawal from Lake Toho. And on June 17th, the actual stage my hypothetical example here, it would be 52.25. If you look on the chart for that day, the reservation water line is 52.53. So we are below the reservation stage. So therefore withdrawals are not permitted for that day. Now, just letting you know also the official time for the monitoring of this uh, on, a day, on a daily basis is gonna be 10 o'clock a.m. So every day, 10 o'clock a.m., that's the official monitoring time. And withdrawals, if, if allowed under the rules, they would be a 24-hour allocation, and then the next day you'd have to check again. Okay, next slide. Here's an example using uh, surface water withdrawals from Shingle Creek. This is a contributing water body to Lake Toho. And so there's a couple of downstream checks here as as I mentioned, you got here in this case, you have two downstream checks. So on hypothetical, hypothetical date of April 17th, if you look at the actual stage, the first downstream check would be, what is the stage in the water reservation water body? And here's Lake Toho. So it's 53.85 on that day, April 17th. And on the chart, the water reservation stage is 53.17. So we are above the reservation line. So Withdrawals would be allowed, but you got to do your downstream check. And if releases are being made from Lake Okeechobee on that day, then withdrawals will be authorized. Okay, and that's uh, next slide. This is the form that the permittees will be using to um, check for compliance, and they're going to have to submit this on a weekly basis. So it's got all of the pertinent information. So it's got the dates and the times and the actual water levels, the reservation stages, the downstream stages, the downstream checks. And it also has in the center the, the provision there in lieu of the meeting the criteria for the water reservation lines, if the district is making a withdrawal, a, a lake drawdown, or discharges from reservation water bodies for environmental releases or regulatory releases, then upon district approval, they could make withdrawals, even though the other criteria may not be met on those days. So there's a, there's a column for that, and then reporting of the daily uh, allocation that was withdrawn. And this is submitted uh, to the district on a weekly basis to check compliance. And that was my last slide. All right. Thank you, Nick. I think at this time we'll go ahead and take some more questions regarding the regulatory criteria that are part of the reservation here. So uh, if we can um, go into the Q&A feature on Zoom and you can ask some questions there. Camille, you want to start out? Sure. We have an upvoted question from Nicholas Porter. He's, good morning. I understand that withdrawals from the Florida aquifer system are not considered a withdrawal of reserved water under the proposal. Potential indirect withdrawals or drawdown in the surficial aquifer system caused by a withdrawal from the Florida aquifer likewise intended to be excluded from the reservation. Nick, you want to go that's ahead and take question. that? Yeah, that's a good question. As the rule is written, there is no um, caveats. If it's Upper Florida, then it's not considered reservation water body. Um, in this area near the reservation water bodies, based on the hydrogeology, there's very, very good confinement uh, between the Florida and the surficial. So we thought that there would be little to no drawdown in the, in the surficial in, in wells in, in this area. But as the rule is written, that's, that's how it is right now. Another, uh, let's see if there's another question here. Just kind of looking through the questions. There's one from Susan Goslin. Okay, go ahead. These, these presentations are mixing how water is measured, the discharge needed for 
Kissimmee River restoration is based on cubic feet per second, while water levels are considered for the non-headwater lakes. Please make the connection as all non-headwater lakes are controlled by structures and what CFS from non-headwater lakes is necessary for Kissimmee River restoration. All right, uh, who is that from? Susan Gosselin. Okay. Should be the second. Okay. Don, this is Cal, can you hear me? Yes. That particular question may be answered after my presentation on the modeling okay. that integrates the water reservation lines with flows and downstream constraints and all that. So if not, I would encourage Susan to maybe restate her question at the end of my presentation and we can address it again then if it's not clear. Okay. There's also a question here from Edward Delaport. Since a portion of the KRR watershed is located within the CFWI and Florida Statute 373-0465 parents 2D requires adoption of uniform consumptive use permitting rules by DEP within CFWI, will these rules have to be adopted and or confirmed by DEP? And I'll, I'll go ahead and take that. No, Jennifer, would you go ahead and answer that question, please? Sure, not a problem. Um, the DEP is taking the lead on, on doing some uniform conditions for issuance in the um, a CSWI specific applicant's handbook. Um, but the DEP has also noted that there will be specific issues, um, specific water resource issues that the individual water management districts would have to handle, um, such as minimum flows and levels and maybe specific um, wetland issues. And so um, this, this is one of those things that the individual water management district will have to um, handle and adopt. Um, and the DEP has worked with us to um, monitor this and review our rules. And it's part of the rulemaking um, process anyway, set in chapter 120 of the Florida statute. They, and um, 373, they do have to uh, review our rules and for consistency with the water resource implementation rule. So they will be looking at the rules, um, but the, the South Florida Water Management District will be the agency adopting the rules. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, there's another question here. What is the rationale for exempting dispersed water management projects. Nick, you want to go ahead and answer that? Or Jennifer? Jennifer, go ahead. I think Jennifer. Sure. Yeah. Um, so dispersed water management projects um, are not looking for a water right to um, water. Um, they are taking water under a detailed operational scheme when water is truly determined to be excess, when water is um, blowing out the estuaries and, and um, you know, causing harmful discharges downstream. And so under those circumstances, we felt that um, it would not be in conflict with the you know, protection of fish and wildlife. The other, the other thing I'd like to add to what Jennifer said is that <clears throat> typically dispersed water management projects also change the timing and distribution of water. And so it's designed to mimic more the natural hydrology. And um, like she said, it, it will capture it during the excess water periods, but then that water would be discharged back into the natural system um, when the water levels are much lower and, and basically mimicking more of a, a natural system response. All right, Camille, any other questions we have here? That 
pertaining specifically to this presentation, I don't believe so. And in the interest of time, I think we should um, go ahead with the presentation. Okay. All right. With that, we're going to turn it over to Cal Nydrower. And uh, Cal, take it away. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Cal Nydrower here. I'm an engineer with the, the Water Management District, and I developed this uh, little computer model uh, that I want to tell you about a little bit. It's uh, basically not designed to um, help design the water reservation criteria. It's designed as a permitting tool to be able to evaluate um, proposed uh, water use permits that come to the water management district and need to be evaluated in, in conjunction with the proposed uh, rule criteria. So next slide, please. What I'd like to do is my presentation has two parts. I'm going to give you a real brief overview of the model itself, the upper Kissimmee operation simulation model, also called the UK ops model. And, uh, and then I'm going to spend some time showing you an example use of the model with a, where a hypothetical water supply withdrawal has been made and assumed and uh, to see how, how that withdrawal um, performs um, with the proposed rule criteria. Next slide. Okay, this is just showing the, the domain of the model is the Upper Kissimmee Basin and the, the lakes on the right hand side that are highlighted in light blue, um, East Lake Coho at the top, Lake Coho in the middle, and then the combined uh, Cypress Hatch and Hawkins Simi system um, there at the bottom. Um, next slide. All right, overview of the model. Uh, the model was designed originally about, uh, I want to say five or six years ago, to quickly test alternative strategies for operating the links, different regulation schedules, if you will. Um, it's been recently modified to serve as a water use permitting tool to evaluate the effects of proposed water supply withdrawals subject to the rule criteria. Uh, it's also been used to test the sensitivity of, of different um, alternative water use scenarios and rule criteria. The model is basically a water budget model. It's a very simple model using a daily time step that uses the historical um, hydrology uh, for the 1965 to 2013 period. And uh, just a very basic uh, water balance or continuity equation um, to um, calculate uh, stages, simulate stages and releases that may be resulting from different operating criteria or proposed water withdrawals. Um, it's simplified in the sense that it does not do detailed hydraulics at the water control structures. That calculation is simplified and adequate for the purposes of this particular type of model. Um, and it's, uh, it generates a, a whole bunch of different types of outputs. I built it in Excel. So the beauty of building a model in Excel is that uh, it's portable. A lot of people can then use it. And if they want to add different features, uh, that can be done relatively easily. It also runs relatively quickly. Next slide. This is an example of the uh, user input interface to the model. Um, you can see the map on the left, and you can click on the, the red highlighted structures to change operations of those structures. Um, and uh, on the right-hand side, the area in black is the this scenario manager at the top, where you can make up four different types of simulations or retrieve the inputs from previously made simulations. And that region at the bottom, uh, those bottom um, buttons basically uh, links directly to different worksheets in the workbook that uh, show different types of model outputs for everything from hydrographs and duration curves to water budgets and uh, different types of statistics. Next slide. The structure of the model, we'll go over this in detail, but you can see in the upper left is a little um, little icon representing the, the user interface. Uh, that, that worksheet interacts with the other worksheets in the, in the model. Um, and when you make a run, it creates a, uh, it saves the inputs and outputs on these worksheets in the middle there called all zero up to all three. Um, the uh, right hand side represents a, a subset of the different types of outputs that can be generated. And, and those outputs are, are basically 
um, determined by pulling the key information from each of the output worksheets in the middle. There's more detail on this in the technical document that, that Sean covered earlier. Next slide. This is an example of an input worksheet for, for Lake Toho. Um, the uh, graphic on the upper right represents the regulation schedule in black and the different zones of the regulation schedule using different line colors. Uh, the, uh, the red line is an older version of the uh, draft water reservation line for Lake Toho, that, that red dash line. Uh, all those things can be changed in the model for doing scenario testing. Uh, when we release the permitting version of the model, some of those things will be locked down. But uh, the whole idea is for operations, you can change uh, these parameters and test different ideas. Uh, down towards the bottom, if you do a click on the, the slide, please, it'll, it'll highlight the region at the bottom, which is the water supply withdrawal options. This is where uh, a user would use the model in that little yellow box there to change the, uh, the pump capacity, the proposed pump capacity for pulling water out of, out of uh, a particular lake. And in the example I'm going to show you in a minute, um, the scenario was to pull uh, 64 million gallons a day or 99 CFS as a, a nominal pump capacity uh, from, from Lake Toho. Uh, but this is the portion of the input where you make that kind of a change. All right, next slide. Some example outputs, uh, just about anything you can imagine that uses uh, daily flows or daily water levels. Um, and here we're looking at a time series of daily flows and water levels for Lake Kissimmee. And then the lower panel represents the same type of information for, for Lake Toho. Uh, you can compare it up to four different simulations and get an idea of how timing and, and magnitude change. This is kind of a display of the raw output from the model. Next slide. Another example of output are, are stage and flow duration curves. These are often used by engineers to get an idea of the, uh, the basically the distribution of the information. Uh, next slide. Uh, this, these are percentile plots that kind of give you an idea of uh, the percent chance that the water levels will be in above and below the various lines. Um, there's pages on the left and, and uh, flows on the right. Next slide. Okay, some of the applications of the model so far, uh, we use it for seasonal operations planning. Uh, a couple of times a year, uh, the river scientists conduct a, a workshop to uh, with uh, other agency folks to try to determine what the operation needs to be for the upcoming season. And the model is often used to test different scenarios for that. Uh, secondly, the, the Water Management District produces what's called a dynamic position analysis, and they share that information at the board meeting every month in John Midnick's presentations. And this particular model, the Upper Kissimmee UK Ops model, um, does the simulation for the, uh, the outflows from Lake Kissimmee which are then routed through the river system down to Lake Okeechobee, and that's a, that's a boundary and flow then that's used for the, the uh, dynamic position analysis. Uh, the third one there is that the, the model's been used uh, by the Army Corps to um, uh, assist with uh, determining the uh, East Lake Toho drawdown operation uh, criteria, which is actually in effect right now, and it's more recently been used for uh, determining the uh, uh, temporary deviation to the, the Lake Toho, I'm sorry, to Lake Kissimmee Cypher from the Action Hall uh, regulation schedule for the remainder of this summer. Um, the fourth one there is bolded because I'm going to get into that in a little bit more detail. That's the application that we use to test the sensitivity of a hypothetical water withdrawal um, in conjunction with the proposed water reservation criteria. And the fifth one there is, is uh, basically, I think Nick mentioned it earlier, there's already been a permit application that came in a year or two ago uh, for the Lake Toho Alternative Water Supply uh, project. And uh, we used the, the model, actually, the consultant used the model to um, uh, determine the, the reliability of, of the withdrawals and, and other factors. Okay, next slide, I'll get into the, uh, the application. Um, the purpose of this application, as I mentioned a couple of times, we wanted to look at the at a hypothetical water supply withdrawal from Lake Toho and see how that withdrawal performed. Uh, you know, what kind of reliability of withdrawal did, did we get and, uh, you know, subject to the water reservation criteria. 
um, we looked at two different scenarios um, compared to a baseline. We looked at, uh, and I'll get into this on the next slide, but the, the basic idea is we wanted to look at reliability and how it changed um, by um, looking at the incremental effects of the Lake Okeechobee constraint on the, on with the rule criteria. So the next slide explains that in a little bit more detail. There's three runs. We did a base run, uses the, the Lake Kissimmee, Cypress, and Hatchenhow regulation schedule, the, the headwaters regulation schedule that's uh, proposed that, um, uh, that Steve explained. You know, it's a higher regulation schedule of part of the Kissimmee River restoration project. So that one's assumed to be in place, and the standard schedules for East Coho and Lake Coho were used. There's no new water supply withdrawals from that particular scenario. The two scenarios that we looked at, in addition to the base then, were uh, this WS max, water supply max scenario. That is exactly the same assumptions as the base, but has a water supply withdrawal from Lake Toho. And uh, use 64 MGD, which is about 99 CFS pump capacity. And I picked that for a good reason that I'll tell you about when I'm showing you the results. Um, the water supply max L scenario is the, has the same assumptions as water supply max, but it's the one that just adds that Lake Okeechobee constraint. So we can see the full effect of the proposed uh, water reservation rule criteria. Next slide. All right, this is something that may be redundant with uh, Zach or Nick's presentation, but this is showing uh, the black regulation schedule for Lake Toho. And then the, uh, the green line, uh, I'll have to say, is not the, the currently proposed water reservation line for Toho. It's a, kind of a penultimate version that was used for some of our testing. That's why that green line has a little kink in the middle of a march there. But uh, the basic idea is the same. When the water levels are below that green line, uh, no withdrawals are allowed from Lake Coho. And water levels, when water levels are above the green line, then water levels are allowed, subject to the other conditions of the, of the rule criteria. Uh, next slide. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking a little bit more about the Lake Okeechobee constraint. Um, the idea is when Lake Okeechobee is discharging uh, regulatory releases from the lake, that's when the Army Corps is making releases to manage the lake stage, um, then that is a time when uh, withdrawals upstream would considered, are considered to not have an impact on downstream lake users. So what we see in the graphic is a subset of the simulation period uh, the water levels in the lake are the colored ones. They're red sometimes and they're green other times. The repeating black line represents the bottom of the current Lake Okeechobee regulation schedule low subband. The reason that that one was shown is because above that line, you can pretty much be assured that the Army Corps is discharging water to manage the lake stage. Uh, below that line, it's a little bit more questionable as to whether the releases that the Army Corps are making are for environmental water supplies or water supplies for consumptive uses, uh, but you can pretty much be assured that they're not being made to, to manage the lake stages. So what happens is in the simulation for the model, we're using the, the lower zone 8 regulation schedule as our defining criteria for whether regulatory releases are being made or not. And this information is coming from the EIS that was used to, to design and approve the, uh, the lower zone 8 schedule. So when the stages are colored red, that means no releases, uh, are no withdrawals are allowed upstream. When the stages are colored green, that indicates the timing of when releases, again, I said it backwards. When it's green, that indicates times when upstream withdrawals are allowed for the rule criteria. Okay, next slide. I will get into some of the outputs. Uh, the red uh, ellipse show the key findings of this particular scenario, uh, these scenario runs. The base run is the first uh, box and whisker plot on the left. The important information is the dot, which is the, the average annual flow. This condition run, there's 704,000 acre feet per year. That's an average annual uh, that, that are released at S65. Uh, with the water supply max scenario, we see 669,000 acre feet a year is the average annual number. That's a reduction of exactly 5%. And that's why I picked the, uh, uh, the 99 CFS or 64 MGD, depending on the units that you prefer, 
Uh, that's why I picked that number for this scenario, because it pushed it to the limit and, and gave us the, the maximum amount of withdrawal that, that could happen. Uh, that gives us 5%. And then the third box and whisker plot there, the average for the water supply max L scenario, you can see it's 686. Uh, 1,000 acre feet a year, and that is a reduction of 2.5, 2.6%. Um, the re reason why it, it got, uh, it was less impactful is because the Lake Okeechobee constraint reduces the amount of time that the withdrawals are permitted to happen. In fact, it cuts that time in about half. Uh, next slide. This is an example output showing uh, annual water budgets that are produced by the model. Um, the top one is the Lake Oke the, sorry, the Lake Toho budget for um, the, the baselines, I'm sorry, for the water supply max scenario. And the lower panel represents the uh, water budget for the water supply max L scenario, for the one with the Lake Okeechobee constraint. If you look real close, uh, just below the orange bar, which represents the uh, evapotranspiration, you can see uh, there's a kind of a violet color um, bar that represents the, the water supply withdrawal that's made from Lake Toho. In the upper panel, it's pretty consistent. There's some kind of withdrawal that's happening just about every year. When the Lake Okeechobee constraint is added, you can see that there's a reduction in the magnitude of some of those water supply withdrawals. You can see the timing of those changes considerably. In other words, 1971 through 1977, also are very little withdrawals that are actually allowed during that time. And uh, the bottom line is the uh, the number of days with water supply withdrawals reduces by about 50% with the Lake Okeechobee constraint. Next slide. This is an example output just showing you the percentile plots for Lake Toho, the water levels, and you can see how they change. The black represents the baseline. The red, you can see, and I'm looking in March and April, you can see that there's a, a reduction in the, in the stages during that time as a result of the withdrawal. And then with the Lake Okeechobee constraint, the green line kind of rebounds a little bit, comes back up again because there are not as many withdrawals that are permitted with the Lake Okeechobee constraint considered. Now that, that run, that water supply max L run, I didn't adjust the, uh, the, the pump capacity for withdrawals. Yeah, I mean, in theory, you could, you could bump that back up to get back up to the 5% level. Uh, but I didn't do that for this analysis. I'm just trying to show the sensitivity of adding the lake open strength. Next slide. Okay, these last few slides are an attempt to show a table that was designed for the, uh, the permittees to get an idea of performance of the withdrawals. Uh, so this is Lake Toho, and what we're seeing on the, the table here are years on the rows and months on the columns for the left-hand side. Uh, the right-hand side has some statistics, but what each of the, the cells represent in that year-month part of the table, the colorful part of it, are the number of days that the simulation allowed withdrawals to happen consistent with the rule. Um, what we can see, uh, first glance, lots of reds and greens. The greens represent um, more days uh, in March, April, and May, if you look closely at the numbers, you can see that it looks like almost every day during almost all of those years, there was a, uh, a full withdrawal that was, that was allowed. Um, the next slide will show you how that changes with the Lake of the Chobe constraint, because this is the water supply max scenario. And if you go to the next slide, you see the water supply max L scenario turns a lot of that green to red. Uh, and in fact, um, the user can input a reliability criteria, and I put arbitrarily in, in these particular tables a 70% reliability um, uh, threshold, which what that means is I want to see how many, how much of the time that the withdrawals were allowed at least 70% um, of the time. You know, how many years does the withdrawal exceed 70% uh, of the time uh, allowable? So. What we see in the water supply max run is about eight of 49 calendar years that are simulated here, where the water supply withdrawals are, are allowed at least 70% of the time. And then with the water supply max L scenario, adding the lake open strength, that cuts that statistic in half, where only four of the 49 calendar years um, 
you get the full withdrawal occurring more than 70% of the time. So this detail is um, explained further in the technical document if it's not clear from my presentation, uh, but I'll be glad to try to answer any questions about it online here. Um, I think I've got a conclusion slide and, and I think I'm wrapped up. Next slide, please. Okay, in summary, uh, we developed this model originally to test water operation strategies quickly, and it was later modified for uh, the purposes of uh, being used to evaluate surface water withdrawals consistent with the, the proposed reservations rule. Um, the model does up to currently up to 49 year simulations using a daily time step. I think the rule criteria is limited to a subset of that, a 40, 41 year period from 1965 to 2005. I think is the, uh, the period used for the 5% check. Um, the, uh, the model uh, gives immediate feedback, uh, you know, less than five minute run times. It gives you a variety of different performance object performance measure outputs. And since it's built in Excel, you can make those changes quickly for, you know, adding additional criteria. Uh, we had the model peer reviewed last fall and uh, got favorable results from that peer review and the peer review reports are also included in appendices to the technical document. And I think Shark covered that earlier as well. And with that, I think I'm finished. All right. Thank you, Cal. Appreciate the presentation. And um, at this time, we're going to go ahead and take some questions pertinent to uh, this particular presentation. So if you have some questions, as I indicated previously, if you go to the Q&A feature on your Zoom toolbar, you can type in your questions. There are a couple uh, general questions uh, um, that I want to go ahead and just tackle real quick. Uh, one was from uh, Joan, uh, Joan Bosch, um, assuming these presentations will be available on SouthFlorida.gov. Yes, this information, and there was also some other questions um, about where the technical document and perhaps the rules are available. All of this information is on our water reservations website. So if you go to our main website, sfwmd.gov, and you click on that and then go into the search engine and just type in water reservations, it will take you right to it. Okay. Uh, Camille, you want to go ahead and uh, follow up with another question? We don't have any specific to UK ops. Um, so there's two general questions um, from Diane Perry. She asks, these bodies of water contribute to smaller bodies of unmonitored water body. When a permit is issued, is there a way to see the impact of those outlying waters that the monitored bodies contribute to? Yeah. Nick, you want to go ahead and answer that question? Um, Camille, could you indicate who asked the question again? Sure, that was Diane Perry, the top question. Okay, repeat the question the, one uh, more time, please. Yeah, I'm, re I'm reading it. I'm just trying to think of a way to answer it. Um, un these bodies of water contribute to smaller bodies of unmonitored water bodies. Um, when the permit is issued, is there a way to see the impact of those? I'm not really sure I understand the question. I mean, we are, this rule pertains to all the water bodies that are reservation water bodies. So and I think it's not really sure. Yeah, Nick, I think that brings up a good um, a, a good topic to make sure that when you're posing your questions online for us to answer, just make sure that you have the whole context of the question there so we can make sure we can give you a thorough answer. That would be very much appreciated. I think, yeah, I got some input um, from Jennifer. You know, if we see a concern, then we would impose monitoring and reporting conditions. So this goes back to the permitting uh, conditions for issuance. So if uh, any permit is issued, they still have to meet the conditions for issuance. And if there's any harm that's being 
uh, suspected, then you know there's conditions that um, regulate that. So if monitoring is it looks like it's necessary, then we would actually put that in in the permit if if required. But you know if the impact assessment shows something of concern, yes, we would follow. Uh, you know, current rules and require some sort of monitoring. So hopefully that should answer. Thanks, Jennifer, for your input. And certainly, Nick, uh, uh, when we've issued permits in the past uh, that are using part of the reserve water, we also uh, have had the compliance form that has to be, uh, you know, when they're making withdrawals, they have to fill out the compliance form. They have to turn it in how often? Did you say weekly or every two weeks? Yes, every week. Every week. Okay. All right. Camille, do we have any other questions here? We have um, one asking about future old. Uh, their future holding water area available in the Kissimmee during flood hurricanes. So if there's excess water to avoid Lake Go from releasing too much water. This is Don. I'll go ahead and take that. Um, I think really what this rule does is it does two things. One, it protects fish and wildlife, but it also, one big advantage is, it also indicates when withdrawals can occur. And so as those withdrawals occur within the upper watershed, when they meet the permitting criteria and the downstream constraints, it would actually prevent that water from going further south. So it would actually help in that regard. All right, okay. so if you have, and let me just state for the, uh, for everybody that, you know, we're at the public comment period. So any questions you have about any of the presentations, any of the technical document uh, information, data analysis approaches, or any questions about the rules, uh, feel free to type them into your Q and A session or, or feature, and we'll be sure to try and answer those at this point. Go ahead, Camille. It looks like there's a follow-up question, Arlene Stewart. Um, she says, I think perhaps we wonder what happens if the user is out of tolerance or out of compliance of their permit, I'm guessing. Um, so I guess that's a question for Nick. Yes, um, actually I just typed in an answer. And so we have a water use uh, compliance section in the Water Use Bureau and they're very active and they're sole job is to monitor permits for compliance and they also uh, could do enforcement if possible but um, we have a very good group that we specialize on uh, compliance of water use permitting and over allocating and things like that so uh, we have a very good uh, tight control over the permit conditions to make sure that they're meeting their uh, permit conditions and they're staying in compliance. Okay, thanks Nick. Any other questions, feel free to type them in at this point in time. Hey Don, it's Jennifer. Can I just yes. um, make one more statement? Um, sure. uh, at the January 31st District Governing Board workshop that was held, um, I believe it was St. Lucie County, the Water Use Bureau did a really comprehensive presentation on the permitting criteria, the compliance and enforcement um, process that they use. Um, and it's available on our district website. Um, if anybody would like to um, view that video, I think it um, provides great background information on, on the district's regulatory um, division for, for consumptive use, and it might be helpful. Okay, great. Yeah, all of the workshop and governing presentations are all uh, archived video uh, links that you can uh, click on to and actually hear the presentations that were given at that time. So it is very beneficial to go back and look over that information. That's a great suggestion. Thank you.
All right. Um, do we see any more other questions there, Camille? I'm kind of scouring through these. I don't see any new questions. Um, there is one from Diane Perry asking if the presentation will be available online. So I'll just provide the web link that Tony gave in the previous answer to her. Okay. And I'll cover um, that in the next in the next short presentation as well. Okay, great. All right. Uh, I think we've gone through most of the questions. If I'm missing anything, team, if you would let me know. So let me go ahead and uh, continue on. And, you know, I, I just wanted to mention to the public out there also that this isn't the only opportunity to provide public comments. We're going to keep the the window open for written comments for the next 30 days. So um, if you want to go ahead and uh, provide written comments, either by email or a, an actual letter, uh, feel free to do that. And we'll, uh, we'll certainly take your concerns into consideration. And with that, I'm going to go um, forward now uh, to our next steps, and then we'll uh, conclude the, uh, the workshop. So again, public comments, uh, we're asking you to submit them by May 18th, Monday, May 18th. And you can submit those comments to Tony Edwards at the address that you see here, or you can submit them to our uh, website toolbox um, website, which is what we also refer to as the web board. So either of those, uh, you can submit the letter, email, however you prefer to provide any public comment. Uh, the workshop presentations will be posted on the reservations website. And um, so that link is, um, like I indicated before, sfwmd.gov, and then type into the serpent search engine, water reservations, and the, the water reservations page will come up. And um, our next workshop, just to put this date on your calendar as a placeholder, um, it would be good to um, go ahead and um, put that on your calendar now for our next workshop, and then we'll kind of go forward um, with that. And uh, I'm suspecting that the webinar will be similar to the format that you see today uh, with the pandemic potentially, hopefully winding down by that time, but uh, appreciate everybody's understanding. Um, um, this is a new format, new to us, and it's taken a, a few dry runs to get through this and uh, get all the kinks worked out. So here's the reservations webpage, some more information for you, and then the, uh, the web board, which is specific to the Kissimmee Reservations uh, room development effort. Um, you can add information there. And then again, if you need to see anything about our district rules, there's a link for the rules as well. So with that, uh, I think we're going to wind it up and just let you all know that uh, any questions that we did not get to, if we missed inadvertently, we will provide written responses to those uh, and then post that on our web board. Uh, so if you have any, any other comments, we we'll, welcome you to submit this information and we appreciate you being part of this process. Uh, I know it's been a different format, but uh, in either case, um, I'd like to just thank you for your time, taking time out of your schedule to attend the workshop today. And despite the challenging times, and we've had a really large turnout, we've had uh, roughly a 141 people in attendance in the workshop today, which is spectacular. And uh, we certainly uh, appreciate the positive and productive dialogue. And again, just uh, any comments you have for us, please submit those by May 18th. And uh, we'll be sure to take those into consideration. Once again, thank you for your time and uh, hope you all uh, remain healthy and safe until we meet again. Thanks a bunch. Bye-bye.